Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for attending this presentation. Due to my teaching tasks, I'm not able to be here in person right now, and I hope to join the session later. I sincerely apologize for this. On the other hand, uh, see how amazing our times are, that I can be in two places at the same time? My talk today is part of my project, Mapping Rabbinic Emotions. Much work on rabbinic emotions has been done, and I'm relying on a lot of it. But please forgive me if I cannot mention everyone in my talk today, as the time slot of 15 minutes is very limited. You will all be there in the publication that follows. So let me share my screen now. Mm -mm -mm. So let me share my screen now. I hope you can all see that. They say that uh, rabbinic culture does not have a word for emotion, as did the biblical language. This, of course, does not mean that they did not recognize emotions, but that the various emotions were not conceptualized by them as one phenomenon. We therefore would look into a variety of words that express things that we would cluster as emotions. One candidate for such a study is the word Yetzer. Is Yetzer an emotion? Yishai Rosentzvi studied the Yetzer for itself, not looking at it from a perspective of the study of emotions. I rely on his work and toward the end of this presentation, I will look into the Yetzer within the framework of emotions, but I will do so after I sketch the basic lines of my mapping of rabbinic emotions. And after I look into a few words, roots, uh, and frame those within my approach, and then see whether the Yetzer can be placed in such a framework. When looking into emotions, we tend to ascribe to them aspects of embodiment. So I will say something about emotions and embodiment without going too deeply into theoretical issues. The most recent scientific literature about emotions asserts that the relationship between bodily reactions and emotions is not an habitual juxtaposition. There is no universal correlation between a bodily phenomena and an emotion. Tears can be of happiness or sadness. Sweat can result from fear or other excitements. And this holds true also for facial expressions, even though earlier we were led to think that these were universal. Rather, we should think of a range of physical phenomena that testify to bodily arousal, to emotionality, dilation of the pupils, salvation, increased respiration, increase of heart rate or secretion of hormones. What is unique in the case of emotions is that this arousal is brought to the consciousness, to our awareness, as usually we are not aware of such physiological changes in our body. This awareness enables the organism to choose the appropriate reaction to the cause of the bodily arousal and in the case of humans, this awareness enables them to assign a word to the combination of situation and arousal. Love to an increased heart rate and the sight of a loved one. Compassion when feeling or tearing upon encountering a suffering other, etc. To illustrate, it comes down to the question what the girl on the left says to herself. Is it, I'm not reading, and then she's not emotional, or is it, I am deprived of a book, and then she is ascribing personal value to the situation, and she finds herself deprived. This, in turn, can move her to act, that is, to acquire a book how to conceptualize this difference in a way relevant for rabbinic culture. It is difficult to know when an action in rabbinic narrative co-occurs co 
with physical changes or when physical reaction co occurs with awareness. But we find words which point to a relation between arousal, meaning, and action. So after understanding the embodiment and seeing the personal meaning behind the drive to act, which follows this arousal, let us look at this representation of the relationship. I will use the term semiosis for the process of meaning making. Action with semiosis is not emotional as no bodily arousal is involved. This is not completely true biologically, but I will not go into this now. Our modern conceptualization of emotion, which is based on a Greek one, sees it as arousal with semiosis, without there being necessarily an action. We talk about being in the emotion. We pause and sense it, and then decide to act or not. At least this is how we perceive ourselves in Western culture. In rabbinic literature, we find a lot of the arousal action line as a human phenomena, but they are not very interested in it until the action happens to be a culturally controlled action, an action with religious significance, with halachic or moral significance. This is my mapping of the basic categories to help relate to rabbinic emotions taking into consideration the embodiment and the semiosis. So I will look into some rabbinic concepts that have emotional uh, relevance, two roots and one expression in relation to this mapping. And we'll, we'll then see uh, where Yetzer stands in relation to all of these. Until I come up with better concepts, I will call these categories A, B, and C. Let's look at the root Lahat originally having to do with uh, heating. The root lahat serves to describe wanting intensively to do and initiated doing mostly on a regular basis. There's no indication of any semiosis on the part of the doer. Therefore, it is only problematic if the action itself is problematic, not the intention. I'll use the verb obsessed to uh, translate uh, this root, even though uh, it is perhaps not the most accurate translation. So such actions are attributed to animals. Number, source number one on your handout. A snake is obsessed with garlic. We have a story of a wild snake as opposed to a home snake who came down from the mountain and finished a whole bowl of garlic. Uh, source number two, uh, a fly is obsessed with a strike in Psikta de Rav Kahana, referring to a fly's uh, tendency to return to the vicinity of people, knowing, as the rabbis think, that it is going to be hit. This is a parable about Amalek initi initiating a fight with the Israelites in Rafidim. Source number three on your handout, a dog is obsessed with carcasses from Genesis Rabbah, apparently referring to the scavenger canines. This is again a parable about the Israelites in Egypt habituated in worshiping the local idols. The fact that animals are said to have this drive entails the lack of semiosis, as animals do not attribute symbolic meaning to eating the garlic or the carcasses. But the root is also used on people. Uh, source number four, a parable from Leviticus Rabbah. The parable tells about the king's son whose heart was not right, and he became accustomed to eating non-kosher meat, nevelot vetrefot. The king said, let such meat be constantly on my table, and I will restrict myself uh, from it. The king thus kept the relationship with the son by enabling him to eat the food he was uh, driven to eat. And here comes the explanation of the parable. The Israelites were obsessed lehutim with idol worshiping in Egypt, and they brought sacrifices to them. This is why God established sacrifices for himself in the desert, as this would keep them, the Israelites, from sacrificing to idols. That is, they will continue doing that which they are obsessed with 
only for a good cause. Here we see that the obsession itself was not a problem, but the problem was the negative value of the act. Therefore, the healing was to redirect the obsession, doing the exact same action only for a good cause and not to fight the obsession, not to annihilate it. Source number five, this is from the Palestinian Talmud. Here we read about the cultivation of an obsession. 40 years prior to their exile to Babylonia, they, the Israelites, planted date trees there to make themselves obsessed with sweet things because it habituates the tongue for the Torah. Admittedly, the wording is not very clear, but regardless of what the implied process was, the obsession is purposely cultivated as it is paralleled with the recitation, if not the study of the Torah, an important value in rabbinic culture. The cases we saw here refer to a customary conduct which drives an animal or a person. In the case of animals, there is no symbiosis, but regarding the people, these actions are meaningful, either as positive or as negative ones. The solution, resolution of the obsession does not include social punishment or prohibition, probably because punishment seems useless. When people perform the same act as senseless animals, there is no semiosis behind the act, no intention, no kavana. Therefore, when the semiosis changes, proper sacrifice, not to idols, the problem is solved. So this root, lahat, is in the B area on the mapping of rabbinic emotions, far from the peak of semiosis. What we see with the verb hamad, to crave or to covet, is a sequence of emotion and action. This means that there is a gap between the two, like in the category A area, the area of emotions as a state of being. So is the Hamad semiotic here? Source number six from Sifre on Deuteronomy is the story about Rabbi Elazar ben Shamoa and Rabbi Yochanan the shoemaker, two Tanaim, who went to Nisbis, outside of the land of Israel, according to rabbinic geography, to study Torah. Arriving at Sidon, north of the Kinneret, they looked back at the land and started crying because they were leaving their beloved country. They then argued that inhabiting the land is more important than all other commandments and returned to stay in the land. Three things makes this event different from what we have seen earlier. First, as I said, the gap between the sensation and the action. Second, the sensation is now endowed with meaning. When feeling the sorrow, the rabbis argue for staying in the land, thus making meaning of it, of the pain. And thirdly, the embodiment is here described in a stylized literary manner, crying, which biologically is hormonal reaction. This story in the early halachic midrash is supported by the halachic explanation in Mechilta of Rashbi, source number seven. Here we read, how do we know that if a person envisions, and I'm, I'm not translating here desire as is usually done, he will end up coveting, as it says, and here they quote a uh, reworked verse from Deuteronomy. How do we know, the text continues, that if a person covets, he will end up seizing what he covets. And here they quote a verse from Micah. The Midrash Halakha presents a sequence of inner activity, envisioning, which leads to a drive, coveting, which then leads to an action, a wrong one in this case. In the mapping of the emotional process, this would cover area A and B, and also point to a gap between not only the drive to do and the act, but also between the mental state, envisioning, Iva, the drive, Kovet, Hamad, and the action, sees Gazal. This sequence is a place where a person is held responsible for his actions, including the mental ones. So unlike the drive referred to by the root Lahat we saw above, when the transgressor can be corrected by redirecting the act, Hamad entails symbiosis and thus renders the transgressor accountable for their drives and actions, it is they who have to correct themselves. 
Among the reproach speeches in the book of Jeremiah, one finds the story of the Rechabites. They serve as an example of piousness as they adhere to their father's command not to drink wine, even when brought to the temple and being offered with wine to drink. In rabbinic halachic literature, the Rechabites are in the list of priestly families that serve in the temple. And in Aganic literature, they are proclaimed the offspring of Jethro and therefore converts that joined the Israelites voluntarily. They are still an epitome of piousness. Their piousness is proclaimed in Sifre Zuta on Numbers, together with Jethro. If someone who had been from the nations of the land, because he did out of love, God gave him out of love, referring to God's promise to keep the Rechabites in his service all the days, how much more so if they had been from Israel? So the Rechabites, the converts, are praised for their doing out of love, but it would have been better had it been the Israelites who did this. Our issue here is, of course, the doing out of love. We see here a separation between the act and the state of mind, the emotion, love. The halachic Tanaitic sources distinguish between acting out of love and acting out of fear a distinction which is a sore point of theological disagreement regarding jobs in incentive to act, where Rabban Yohanan ben Zakkai argues for fear and his student Rabbi Yoshua argues for love. The debate itself points again, as did the quote above, to an ambiguity regarding doing out of love. The ambiguity regarding this positive route is interesting. It continues the use of this root in the narrative biblical text, where it refers to a spontaneous action that diverts from the socially proper or expected conduct. In rabbinic culture, I ascribe this ambiguity to the image of the halachic person the rabbis had in mind for the society they worked to establish and keep. Relying on emotionality, love, as the incentive for acting, even halachic acting, is not safe. A society of people in love is not sustainable. The rabbis, therefore, while tolerating positive, intensive attitude toward halachic conduct, did not demand it as a default state of mind. In terms of the map I drew earlier, we find here an unexpected, I think, combination between one of the most highly valued semions of rabbinic culture, halachic conduct, and a high arousal, a positive one, love. This correlation is only tolerated and is not promoted, as I think we would have expected. Doing out of love is pushed away from the map. The Tanaitic expression, doing out of love, is found in sources of the Akivian school only, the one to become later the dominant in rabbinic culture, and in none of the Ishmaelites ones. This takes us nicely into considering the place of Yetzer in this scheme, in this map. So how does the Yetzer fall into this map? Is the Yetzer an emotion? There is much to expand on this, and I will only sketch some points here. As I said, I'm relying heavily on Rosensvi's work with regard to the Yetzer. There is parallels in the attitude of the two Tanaitic school to Yetzer and to emotions. We saw this regarding doing out of love. The one of Rabbi Ishmael avoids both altogether, and the Rabbi Akiva accepts both with due restrictions as these could be directed to the good or bad. A second point of parallelism, Yetzer is highly semiotic. It is not a drive per se, but a drive to do something very good or very bad. This puts Yetzer in a similar domain to emotions as we think of them as, and as we found with regard to uh, Hamad. 
However, as Rosensky has shown, while inside a person, the Yetzer is not one and the same with the person. It is an external entity, a highly personified one in Amoraic literature. This creature leads people in a way different from what they have initially wanted. As an external being, where in the anatomy of a person does the Yetzer reside? As Kipiewasser points out in his article about the heart, the Yetzer is found outside the opening of the heart. The Yetzer thus functions as a layer between the emotion, the semiotic arousal, and the action. So this is the mapping of the Yetzer between the emotion and the action. I will end now with a short summary of the finds. The rabbinic effort is to encourage a halachic person who is highly semiotic, but not, but not overdriven. They do acknowledge the role of arousal in the creation of engagement, including semiotic engagement, including semiotic engagement, but they do not encourage access of arousal. This does not necessarily entail that they are asking to restrain the emotions as here comes the Yetzer into play. The rabbis are asking not to give in to this external creature whenever it has a bad influence. I end here. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you later on.